That's when the reservations were, were founded or established. The president uh, handed over the reservation leadership to four different denominations and said, okay, this, this reservation is going to be Presbyterian, this one's going to be Catholic, this wasn't the Indian people, this was the government, okay? This one's going to be Catholic, this one's going to be whatever. Subjugated on the basis of systemic violence on a, as massive a scale as necessary to accomplish the result. And then they, they tune you up the, the indoctrination and all the rest of that. And you get that through the schools, you get that through the prison system, you get it just through the day-to-day -day grind of being told no in every aspect of your existence. You know, I, I never understood that. I was about eight, nine years old, and I was like, wow, you know, this flag that was flowing while all these Indians were getting killed. Oh, these crosses were up in the air, you know, all of all these Indians were getting killed, and, you know, you stand here looking at all these Indians. Let me tell you just a little something about the American Indian in our land. We have provided millions of acres of land for what are called the preservations, or the reservations, I should say. They, they from the beginning, announced that they wanted to maintain their way of life as they had always lived there in the desert and the plains and so forth. And we set up these reservations so they could and have a Bureau of Indian Affairs to help take care of them. At the same time, we provide education for them, schools on the reservations, and they are free also to leave the reservations and be American citizens among the rest of us, and many do. Some still prefer, however, that way of that early way of life and we've done everything we can to meet their demands as to what they how they want to live uh, maybe we made a mistake maybe we should not have humored them in, in that wanting to stay in that kind of primitive lifestyle maybe we should have said no come join us be citizens uh, along with the rest of us. As I say, many have, many have been very successful. And, uh... William Julius Wilson, the, the uh, sociologist who used to be at the University of Chicago, did a study and was able to show that there was a cordon of employment discrimination around inner city neighborhoods. Somewhere between half and three-fourths of employers would not hire blacks under any circumstances. Now, you have the same kind of situation uh, near reservations. I walked clear down to this end, picked up applications, and if I could fill them out right there and talk to somebody right there, I did it. And then when I came back, I came back clear on this side of town. Well, nobody <laughs> ever called. You could just tell they don't want to hire you. They look at you and they think, oh yeah, right, you know. Unless they're really in a dire need mm -hmm. right now, they'll hire you. But if they got choices of who they're gonna hire, you can easily drive through town and see who's all hired. They hit this wall of discrimination. They go around, they try all the fast food places, they try to get construction jobs, and they keep uh, coming up empty handed. And they start to think after a while, well, maybe it's me. Maybe there's something wrong with me. They end up going back to the reservation. Of course, there's no employment there are very little except for with the government or the tribal government or the, or the schools and a lot of times get depressed. And actually it's the matrix of colonial domination, deculturation and the sheer brutality visited upon people from a very young age that leads to these results. It's a, a, a cycle of depression that started probably, oh, you know, probably started about 500 years ago but uh, it especially hit when stu kids were taken from their families. I, I think losing, losing wars, losing, uh, being disenfranchised, not being understood by this group of people who came over and um, occupy this land. 
one day some years ago with certain tribal chairs and, and they came in and one of them stood up and said, I come from a third world country. And he read for the president the, the data, the statistics about his reservation. And uh, they are likely similar to the statistics nationally. Studies show that American Indians and Alaska Natives die at a higher rate than other Americans from alcoholism, tuberculosis, auto accidents, diabetes, homicide, and suicide. In addition, a safe and adequate water supply and waste disposal facility, something we all take for granted, isn't available in 12% of American Indian and Alaska Native homes, as opposed to 1% in the rest of the nation. There were many policies passed, but that did not work. The essence of those policies was the dismantling of our families and the breakup of the structure of how our families lived and the way we lived. To me, the suicide epidemic happening in Indian country is just a manifestation of all this history. Mr. Secretary, there's a young girl who recently took her own life on the Spirit Lake Nation. Her name was Avis Littlewind, and Avis Littlewind was a seventh grader, and she uh, liked riding horses, and she liked playing basketball and listening to music, and they found her hanging in her closet one morning. She'd lied in a fetal she, she was laying in a fetal position in her bed for 90 days missing school uh, her sister had taken her own life uh, two weeks after they found her her other sister uh, drowned uh, driving under uh, the influence of alcohol her father had uh, died of a self-inflicted bullet wound uh, i went to that reservation just some weeks ago to meet with uh, school administrators met with some of the classmates of this young girl what I found there is pretty much what I found in other areas as well. It's a profound lack of resources. To see a lot of kids running around with rope burns from trying to hang themselves at the same age as my baby, you know. And it kills me, you know, when you have that little baby, you, ex you don't expect it to grow up and be, you know. You just want the best for your kids and everything. And seeing their parents, it's really hard not to punch them out and say, look at your baby, straighten up and do something for them, you know. <laughs> I hear a lot of stories of people going to the bars, they leave the kids in, the, in their cars and they're just in there to do, do what they will for till mom or dad's back out and ready to draw home and no one's had a conversation with them. My understanding is that we have trust responsibility for two groups of people for health care in this country. One are prisoners in the federal prison system and the other a trust responsibility for Native Americans. My understanding further is that we spend exactly twice as much per person on health care for federal prisoners as we do to make available health care for uh, American Indians. Indian Health Service is now funded, you know, overall at about 50 percent of need. 50 percent. Um, you go to a, an Indian Health Service hospital and it looks like a hospital in the Soviet Union people are laying in the hallways and lined up uh, and it takes forever to be seen. You know, you've got people who need all kinds of care uh, that aren't getting it. And, you know, it's a tragedy in the making. If we see the economy take any kind of a downturn, a serious downturn, uh, you're going to see those people who are so fragile and so on the edge go over the edge. I think it's hard for um, a leader of the United States to really acknowledge indigenous pain because that brings up the whole cultural and historical legacy.